There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, here I am with another book haul. I've been buying books like crazy to both for no novellas in November and nonfiction November and just because I'm Sean the Book Maniac and, you know, was, had money burning a hole in my pocket. So I love doing book hauls occasionally or whenever the spirit moves me and the spirit has moved me tonight. So without further ado and in roughly the order in which I acquired them, but not I'm not going to be too too fussed about that. This work of literary criticism, The Rhetoric of Fiction by Wayne Booth. I had this, I had, I have a copy of this book somewhere in Canada, but I wanted to get another copy because I remember how helpful it was when I was writing academic essays on literary uh, narrative point of view. And I, as the, those of you who've been following my channel of late, I was on a pro research, doing a research project on the second person point of view, which is now on hold. I won't get into all that right now. And only to discover once I got this book that Wayne Booth dismisses the second person is really silly. And he gives approximately one paragraph to the topic. But anyway, I, re I remember it being a valuable resource when I consulted it as an undergraduate student. So let's see if it's any use to me in my new... Booktube life. This chunkster, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. This is the novel, the first novel ever written, according to, depending on who you ask. And this is the translation by Royal, T Royal Tyler. And I will be buddy reading this with Britta Bowler next year sometime. Maybe for, maybe for all of next year. So really stoked about that. When it came down in price, and I could get it using my Prime membership on Amazon for fairly, relatively cheap, I couldn't resist getting the hardcover copy of Richard Powers' The Overstory. I have a bit of a reading and video essay project in mind that involves this sometime at the end of this year. I'll keep it, keep it a secret until closer to the time, but uh, that's why I got it. And it's a beautiful hardcover book. and. Most people whose reading tastes correspond to mine have really liked this and told me that I should read it, so I will try it. And uh, let's, let's hear the opening line, shall we? First there was nothing, then there was everything. Then, in a park above a western city after dusk, the air is raining messages. A woman sits on the ground, leaning against a pine. Its bark presses hard against her back, as hard as life. Its needles scent the air, and a force hums in the heart of the wood. Her ears tune down to the lowest frequencies. The tree is saying things, in words, before words. Starting from scratch by Rita Mae Brown, a different kind of writer's manual. I've talked about this enough. This is for a buddy read that I'll be starting next week with Chris of the Book Kruger's podcast. This is a book that I read and loved as an undergrad and wanted to reread, so I shall. And this is for Nonfiction November. Now, I just made a separate video on this, but just to show it to you again, just because it's got the best title ever. Father may be an elephant and mother only a small basket, but by Gogu Shamala, uh, translated from the Telugu, an ind a collection of short stories by a feminist Dalit writer who writes in Telugu which is the language of the Indian state of Telangana. As I think I made clear in that little video, I can't wait to get to this. When I did my Novellas in November TBR, I mentioned having discovered an article, a review article of this, and I couldn't stop myself from buying it. A Canadian writer who nobody's ever heard of, but apparently writes wonderful novellas, John Metcalf, Vital Signs. This is a collection of how many novellas? collection of five novellas. I would love to get to at least one of the novellas in here for novellas in November, but we'll see. But I, it's a, it's a lovely book from a publisher that I don't think I was familiar with, but the publisher has the same name. It's a Canadian publisher. I don't know where, probably Toronto, but it's Biblioasis, which is the name of a lovely booktuber channel that 
you all should check out. The two books that I was waiting for, I mentioned on a, my nonfiction November TBR. This is the memoir by Reese Davis. I have been corrected and I'm very grateful for having been corrected after I castigated myself for mispronouncing Davies as Davis. In fact, that is how the Welsh pronounce it. So Reese Davis was a short story a writer and novelist. He's been dead for a couple decades, I think, and he was gay but never out. And this is his memoir, Print of a Hare's Foot. One of my subscribers said that he, I don't know, maybe he or she couldn't wait until I finished it because they had just finished it. So hope to get to it this month. Here's the opening paragraph of Print of a Hare's Foot, which was originally published in 1969 and this edition 1998. This July morning, on my way to the marketplace, I had paused for a moment to listen to snatches of song coming from an open window beyond a cottage garden overlooking the river on which fishermen's coracles could be seen. It was an old air, I heard, vaguely familiar to me, but it was the quality of the woman's voice that arrested me. Contralto, running luscious as the juice of a dark plum, it was an untrained and effortless natural. I caught a fleeting glimpse of the singer at an upstairs window as she shook out a duster. She looked one of those amiably blossomed wives with a pot of begonia's chest, a good eater and probable blemishes apart, a remover of irritants from domestic life. Well, I like the writing. I'm not sure about the description of the woman, especially coming from a closet case. Like, how hetero are you trying to be here? But anyway, <laughs> I'll give it a try. And by the same author, this is a sweet, quaint little book. I think if I'm reading my Roman numerals correctly, it was published in 1943. The Story of Wales by Rhys Davis. How many pages is it? 48 pages. And it has some lovely, what do you call it? The plates. The Menai Bridge. Here's Cardiff in 1797. Here is Lanberis Pass. You guys will correct my pronunciation, right? And lots of writing. Lots of stories about, inter you know, whoops, upside down, I think. Upside down. Lots of writing. His little narrative, a personal kind of history or tour of Wales. So, I hope to get to this one this month, too. This is in avid anticipation of buddy reading this, the second Cynthia Proper set novel that Ange and I will be buddy reading. The the Half Sisters. This is the next one that she published after The Sea Change of Angela Lewis, which we buddy read and which I absolutely loved. Cynthia Proper Seton is my favorite writer that nobody's ever heard of, and I feel like an evangelist about her, but I'll see if I still feel like evangelizing after I've read another novel. This one was published 1970, originally published in 1974, so just a few years after the other one. There was a few others published before, which I missed. I thought we were. I thought Angela Lewis was the first one, but in fact there was about three before. And I said to Angela, I don't want to go back, because the sea change of Angela Lewis was a gorgeous, flawed novel, and I didn't want to go back to read how she got to that point in her writing. I want to keep going and see how she developed. I will. If I continue to love her stuff, I will eventually go back and start from the beginning. I think her first book was in the mid-60s or something. But for now, I'm just going to keep going. Let's hear the opening sentence. Yeah, just the, the opening sentence. On a hot Friday afternoon of midsummer 1937, Erica Thorogood, who was a hot, plain child of 11, sat still in her seat in the parlor car of the Cannonball, the express train to Montauk Point, waiting for it to get moving. She smiled shyly and wriggled a finger in goodbye to her mother, who was giving her another reassuring nod through the train window, and wished she would get moving. The car was filled with fathers who were off to join their families for the weekend on the second, better end of Long Island, and one of these fathers, in the seat next to Erica, said to her, "'Well, you are quite grown up to be travelling alone, my goodness!' And Erica said, "'Oh, I have to get used to it. I'm very nearly an orphan.' The father swiveled into retreat. Immediately upon having told the whopper, Erica was swept by a sickening fear of being found out, which was why, eventually, she gave up lying. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I don't know if I can wait until next February. <laughs> Read the half-sisters.
Okay, I was a really bad boy. I feel like Doris. I love the, the, Goris's self-inflicted guilt trips about her butt buying because I empathize. I relate 500% and then she's just... I just want to give her a big hug and say, let's go to the bookstore together. You can blame it on Sean. Yeah, I spent a shitload of, you know, about $100 and here is most of what I got. Most of these are for novellas in November. One of them is for nonfiction November. Houseboy by Ferdinand Oyono. He is I've never I'd never heard of him. Somehow I did recently. I have I don't have a memory of why. Probably just looking for African novellas because I wanted to you know, wanted to read some. He is Cameroonian and it's this novel is in novella is in the form of a diary kept by a Cameroonian houseboy. That is all I know, but it's just over 100 pages, so I will definitely be giving this one a try this month. Let's hear the opening. Oh, and this is translated from the French by John Reed. It was evening. The sun had gone down from behind the high peaks. The deep shadow of the forest was closing in around Acomo. Flocks of toucans cut the air with great wing beats, and their plaintive calls died slowly away. The last night of my holiday in Spanish Guinea came stealthily down. Soon I would be leaving this country, used by us Frenchmen, from Gabon and the Cameroons as a place to slip away for a break, whenever things became a little strained between ourselves and our white compatriots. Again, I have no idea how I encountered this, but I did, and now I have it. The Blind Owl by Sadig Hedayat. Oh, I gotta check that one. I didn't check that one. We'll just record it right on to here. Sadi Hedayat. Sadi Hedayat. Sadi Hedayat. Sadi Hedayat. Sadi Hedayat. Sadi Hedayat. Okay, that's difficult to pronounce. Uh, translated from the Persian by Navid Nuri. And this is published under the auspices of the Sadi Hidiyat Foundation. Translation published in 2011. I didn't, hadn't heard of him. He was Persian slash Iranian. Uh, committed suicide in 1951, aged 48. He was a Iranian writer, translator, and intellectual. And this is his best-known novel. He was the earliest Iranian writer to adopt literary modernism in uh, his writing. So that's all I know about it. It's a short little novella, and it's a very autobiographical. I think it was completed just before his suicide. That's not true. Uh, it was published in 1937, and he committed suicide in 1951. I'll tell you about it. I think I'm going to definitely try it. I'm a little nervous that the foreword, which is all about the translation, is the, almost as long as the book. <laughs> but it's uh, be a quick read. I'm not going to read the foreword unless I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And I'm also not impressed that about 40% of it is in italics. I hate so. I hope I have more positive things to say about it after I've tried it. I had a couple Joyce Carol Oates novellas available to me as ebooks on Scribd, and so I thought this is a good chance to read my very first Joyce Carol Oates. So I asked Eric Carl Anderson for his advice, and the two that I had, he said, "Those don't don't do those. You should try Blackwater." So here I have Blackwater, and I will, yeah, I will definitely get to this this month. And here's the opening: the rented Toyota, driven with such impatient exuberance by the senator was speeding along the unpaved, unnamed road, taking the turns in giddy, skidding slides, and then, with no warning, somehow the car had gone off the road and had overturned in black, rushing water, listing to its passenger side, rapidly sinking. Am I going to die like this? It's 154 pages long, so I think I'll read it fairly chapter quickly. This is a novella from China that I just found out about the day that I ordered it and said, oh, i got to have that. It's from New York Review of Books, The Invisibility Cloak by... Oh. Ge... Ge... Fei. Need some help with that one. So, the Chinese pronunciation. Ge... Fei. Author. Ge... Fei. Author. Ge... Fei. Okay. English, UK pronunciation. 
G.E. Fay, author. It's not G.E. Fay, is it? The initials? Every every reference, it's all capital letters. I don't think that's right. It's G.E. It's not initials G.E. Yeah, no, it's not. So those pronunciations are a mistake. Fay, I guess is Fay, but Ge Fay? Pen name for Liu Yong, a Chinese novelist considered to be uh, one of the preeminent experimental writers in the 80s and 90s in China. And this story is set during the era of new wealth blossoming in Beijing. I'll tell you more about it after I've given it a try. I think it's a pretty gorgeous cover. I would love to read you the opening sentences, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't have the time to look up the pronunciation of, so stay tuned for later. I'll have more to say and read from later. This is a book that I'm currently listening to on audio, Words on the Move, Why English Won't and Can't Sit Still, like literally, by John McWhorter. And I'm really loving it on audio, and I just thought, you know, this is one that I'm going to refer to again and again. I need the physical book, so I've got it. And I didn't know. I've listened to his podcast. I've never occurred to me that John McWhorter is African-American. And he's written a lot about African-American English. Well, that's fascinating. Really enjoying this book. Just listen to a, another chapter tonight. <laughs> this is a Quebec, translated from French, a Quebec novella in every wave by... Charles Quimper. I don't know how you pronounce it because it looks like an English name to me. I would say in English, Charles Quimper, but I'm not sure. Let's see. Charles, Charles, but Quimper, Quimper. Yeah, there's nothing online. He's too young and new of a writer, but that's my best guess. Charles Quimper, in every wave, newly translated. I think it's just came out this week, maybe. Oh, yeah, originally published in 2017, this translation, 2018, by QC Fiction. And uh, I have already bailed on this. I just came yesterday, started it today, didn't like it. I'll have more to say in my Friday reads. And this was pretty expensive for an 80-page book, but that's what you get with novellas, right? And last, but certainly not least, I just picked this baby up at the convenience store 30 minutes ago. Dennis Johnson's Train Dreams. Those of you who watch me regularly know that I started the audiobook last night and I got waylaid because of Victober. was in loving it on audiobook, but I just thought, you know what? I love Dennis Johnson. I need the paper copy too. And as much as time allows, I will read and listen together, but I've got it. Train Dreams. Opening sentence. In the summer of 1917, Robert Granier took part in an attempt on the life of a Chinese laborer caught, or anyway accused of, stealing from the company stores of the Spokane International Railway in the Idaho Panhandle. That opening scene is chilling and uh, unforgettable. All right, so that's my latest book haul. I've got a bunch of other stuff coming in the mail, so there might be another one in November. How about you? Uh, have you read any of these books? Would you recommend any of these books? That's my book haul. Thanks for watching.